The church community is a unit of people who have come together because they are aligned in faith and purpose. Three important descriptors of any true church community should be unity, fellowship and power. These define the early community of believers. You know, last Sunday we all prayed. Uh, there was somebody who shared a testimony on a piece of paper about their upper neck being healed. And so we shared that testimony. And then we prayed for several people. And there was a man watching, young man watching us online. And uh, so he sent his testimony on Wednesday. But this is what he wrote. He said, uh, you know, he had not been well. For three, for three weeks, or for two Sundays, three Sundays, he was not able to come to church. Uh, for two Sundays, he had a major back problem. So that particular Sunday, he was actually lying on bed, and he had to use his dad's walker to move around and all that. Uh, so that particular Sunday, that was last Sunday, he was lying in bed watching our live stream. And, uh, and then he heard us praying for people with back problems. And something happened. The YouTube, uh, he lost his YouTube connection momentarily. And he was shocked, he said. But it came back on. And then right after that, we were praying for people with back issues. Lying on his bed, he said, I raised my hand to God. I cried for healing. And I felt a lot of relief. So immediately, God did something for him. And uh, you know, he's on, on his way. And he, so he sent this testimony uh, on uh, Wednesday. Amen? I right, so we can close it now. Thank God for that. And, uh, you know, I'm sure the others were all, many others sitting here may have experienced, received healing as we prayed. And, and there are many other times when we pray. You know, if you receive something God does for you, uh, send a testimony to us. And you know, many times people feel shy. They just don't make the effort to send a testimony. But I encourage you to do that because then we can share it with others and it'll encourage all our faith that God is doing things amongst us. Amen? That God heals. God delivers. God is, 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 is doing things amongst us. And we want to just thank God for it, celebrate uh, what He's doing. Uh, this morning, I want to take uh, a, a few moments just to talk to us about community. Today is our family fun day. Um, Suhash came up with this idea to have a fun day. And so he said, okay, let's do it. And uh, one of the motivations, one of the reasons why we are having this today uh, is just to build community, build uh, that sense of togetherness. And so I want to take a few moments, it won't be too long, uh, just talk a little bit about community uh, this morning. I just want to make one announcement, it's more of a personal announcement. Uh, Amy and I are going to be traveling for the next three weeks, so uh, if you don't find us in church for the next three Sundays, don't think Pastor backslid. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to us? No, we're just traveling, okay? Uh, we won't be here for three Sundays. Uh, Pastor Jay Kumar will be in charge. He'll be taking care of all the things. Uh, so Pastor Jay Kumar will be ministering two Sundays, and one Sunday, Gene will be ministering here. Uh, so that's what's going to happen next three Sundays. Uh, everything, is go everything will go on as is, just that we're <laughs> traveling for three weeks. All right. So community just spend a few a few moments talking about community especially from our own context uh, what kind of a community what do we want to see uh, happen amongst us what kind of a people uh, do we want to be now when you look at you know the definition of community that word community uh, the dictionary definition would be something like this you know it's a community is basically a people uh, who share common interests and therefore uh, they form a unit. They are, there's a sense of togetherness uh, because of some common interests. And uh, so nowadays, of course, because of the internet and social media, you can have even online communities or virtual communities. You've never seen this person other than their, you know, uh, their, maybe their photograph or maybe whatever they share online. But uh, you never interacted with them uh, physically, uh, but you're part of a virtual community. And so you have all kinds of communities, but there's that sense of being one unit because of shared interests. And in our case, uh, we are coming together as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a common faith. We are submitted to Jesus Christ, and that becomes our common touch point. Uh, the reason why we are a church community. So our 
common interest, so to speak, is our faith in Jesus. We have a common faith. We have a common purpose to which we are called. And so we need to grow together as a community. Now, of course, you know, a week people sitting here, we come from different backgrounds. Uh, we have different uh, cultural backgrounds, language backgrounds, professional backgrounds, social backgrounds. And here we are, we're coming together because of one thing, of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, obviously, there are going to be some things to overcome, some things to grow past in order to become uh, what we can call a Bible community, a, a community that the Bible envisions or presents for us. And so we want to talk a few things about what, it, what, what, kind of a, what are some of the descriptors of a Bible community, of people who have come together because of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, generally speaking, you know, uh, people interact or engage with church uh, at, at these three levels, just broadly speaking. You know, one is there's a very formal engagement in church, meaning you come on Sunday morning, you enjoy the sermon, you enjoy the worship, uh, you take part in the giving, uh, and then as soon as the benediction is over, sometimes before it's over, <laughs> you exit. <laughs> so that's a very formal thing. But if you ask them, which is your home church, they say, yeah, APC is my home church. <laughs> uh, and in some sense, yes, there is a connect, but there is no engagement with the community per se. And sometimes, you know, in the initial stages, it's okay because you're still trying to feel, get a feel of, you know, what is this church all about? How are the people and so on? And then hopefully we go past that to making some friends in church. And so you can just say, now that's a level two engagement where now you've got friends. You know a few people, you know their names. And so after service, you stay back, you make it a point to say hello, shake hands, uh, you interact a little bit. Uh, you may keep in touch with a few people now and then, occasionally during the week. Uh, but that's a little bit more connect to the community because you know a few people. Uh, you know their names. You've seen them uh, over and over over the weeks. And so you have some sort of a friendship that develops. And that's great because that's, that's taking you on further in your engagement with the church community. And hopefully... Uh, um, if not all of us are, are in that stage. And I, I understand that many people are coming in new uh, all the time. So you may be still in that initial stage where, you know, okay, I go to church and come back. Uh, but hopefully you'll move on into that level two of engagement where you have some friends. Uh, you get to know some people and, uh, and they, you know their names and you maybe interact with them a bit. But ideally, uh, this, the third level that we would like to call is where you consider this as your family. That's where we want to be. And that's when real community actually begins to happen. When you make a choice in your heart that APC or this local church is your church family. Let's all say family. today. That means this is my home. This is the place I belong. Family means there's a sense of belonging. Uh, there is a sense of commitment. Uh, there is relationships that are being built. And you begin to see yourself as a son or daughter in the family. Or a father or mother in the family. Uh, there is this relation, meaningful relationships that are being established. And, 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 and there's a sense of belonging. There's a sense of caring that takes place amongst us. As a community. And that's the ideal. That's where we want everyone to be. And then you begin to invest in each other. You begin to share with each other. You begin to be a part of the family journey. Because we are not stagnant. We are going somewhere. We have a vision. We want to become something. We want to achieve something for the cause of God's kingdom. And so you become part of that. And you're journeying together with the church family. As we progress in the call and the assignment that God has for us. And that's ideally where we should all be. Amen? Now, it may not happen overnight. It's okay. We give people the time to make that transition from just that formal engagement with church to having some friends to eventually saying, this is my church family. I belong. Now, like in any family, we have people in all, all stages of growth and development. Right? So you have got those who are like, Children, and that's not to uh, demean anybody, but that's just a fact. Spiritually, they're still learning. They're still growing. Then you have uh, 
you know, young people. Then you have young adults. And then you have fathers and mothers. So in the church family also spiritually, uh, we are personally in a stage of growth and development. And we relate to one another uh, in, at different levels. Meaning what you tolerate with little children, you don't do the same thing with young adults. Right? Little children, you permit them to make a lot of noise. You give them permission to mess up. You give them permission to be treated like babies. That's okay. They, spiritually, they're they just you know, growing. But when somebody is a young adult, the standards change. Are you with me? Right? Because the expectations are different. The responsibilities you carry are different. And when you become a father and a mother in the house, again, things change. Because now you are carrying responsibility. You are going to care for other people in the house. You become part. You have a part of playing the vision, the direction where we are going. And expectations change. Responsibilities change. Uh, because now you are a father or a mother in the house of God. Are you with me? So there is those transitions. They say, why doesn't pastor care for me the way he used to when I was a little baby? Because you were a baby then. Now you're a young adult. Now you're a father or mother. Our interactions change. And uh, our expectations change. And hopefully we all understand those dynamics uh, in a family, in a community that, 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 that functions like a family. So now... Uh, I was just thinking, you know, there are three descriptors we'd like to talk about this morning when we, when we say church community. Three descriptors, especially for us as a believer, community of believers. Number one, we want to talk about unity. Secondly, fellowship. And third, power. These are three important descriptors of any believing community, of a church community. The first one, unity. You know, unity is so important. For us, as a church community, uh, uh, it, it is very. Di- it would be very difficult for us to call ourselves a community if there is no unity. If there is no unity, they, we we can't call ourselves a community. When we say unity, we are talking about the fact that we are together. We are aligned. We are in agreement in faith. And in purpose. That's unity. That commitment that we are together. We are aligned. We are in agreement. In faith and purpose. That's unity. And that's very important for us as a community. And we need to guard that. We need to protect that. Because if anything disturbs unity, it disturbs us as a community. It, 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 it actually makes an attempt to destroy at, at who we are and why we are gathering together. So unity is very important. You know, in the early church, um, that, that, uh, in the book of Acts, we see this word, words, one accord, used often as a descriptor of the early church. One accord, over and over again. That word one accord, if you just look it up in the Greek, it simply means to be a one mind one passion. It is something that is done unanimously. That means everybody is in agreement. That's being one accord. In one accord. One mind, one passion. Now think about the early church. And I'll just make or just quickly go through these references that you find in the book of Acts. That talk about them being in one accord. And let's read them through for us. Acts 1.14. These all continued with one accord. In prayer and supplication. With the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brother. So they were with one accord in prayer. So even when they came to pray, they were for one mind, one passion. We're going after the same thing. Not like, okay, you pray on that. You go pray that direction. You're praying this direction. <laughs> one accord even in prayer. We're going after the same thing. We are one mind, one passion. We are unanimously going after That same thing in prayer. Acts 2, 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They came together, but they were in one accord. And then the wonderful thing happened. Pentecost happened. And uh, Acts 2, 46 says, they continued daily with one accord in the temple. Breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. So just think about it. You know, 
actually they were just like all people's church. Because they had people there from various parts of Asia. And if you read that account in Acts 2 verses 7 through 9, I think it is. It talks about people from Libya, Egypt, as far out as Rome, and all the surrounding re regions of Jerusalem. They're all gathered together. That meant natively they were speaking the languages of those parts of the world. And, you know, but they had adapted to the customs of those regions. And here they were all in Jerusalem when the day of Pentecost happens. And these people who decided to stay back in Jerusalem because of Pentecost. Now the Bible says in verse 46, they were all with one accord. And that is interesting. It's like us. We are people from all across India. And we are all of one we are in one, one in purpose, one in passion. You know, uh, it's okay that we speak. We may have different mother tongues and have different culturally. We are different. But in church, as a community, we are one accord. And no culture is treated of, uh, of any greater importance than the other as when we come together as God's people. Acts 4.24, when they heard this, they raised their voice to God with one accord. That means they were being persecuted. They are facing difficulties. How do they react? One accord, they raised their voice to God. It wasn't like, oh God, let, this, let that group of people who are suffering, let them pray. No, we all get together. We all raise our voice to God with one accord. And in Acts 5 and 12, it talks about mighty God doing mighty things in the, in the midst of this church. It says that to the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord. Now think about this. To the hands of the apostles. How many apostles were there? At least 12. And over time, many others were raised up. So through the hands of the apostles, and we know not just the apostles, but even people in the church, there were all mighty things were being done through them. But you know, they were all with one accord. Nobody said, let's make 12 churches. Peter's church, James church, John's church, Mark, I mean, Matthew, whoever, all the others. No. It was God working through all of them and we are gathered together for him in his name. Our identity does not come from any one of the apostles, any one of the leaders. Our identity is always in Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter who God is using, we are still of one accord. Amen? So that is so important for us as a church. Now, when you just journey with the early church, now, the church in Jerusalem had problems. It wasn't like everything was good. And in fact, when you come to Acts chapter 6, they had problems. Acts 5, they had problems. Acts 6, they had problems. So they dealt with those issues and they kept moving. They kept moving. And then as God raised more apostles and more prophets in the church, and the church expanded throughout that region and new churches were being raised up, the new churches were planted that they also had problems. It wasn't that they didn't have challenges. They had challenges. But, they learn to stay together. Take, for instance, the Corinthian church. Paul himself established that church. Uh, but sooner or later, they began to sense some problems in the Corinthian church. What was happening? Some were saying, I belong to Paul. Some were saying, I belong to Opolis. Some were saying, I belong to Peter. All these are God's servants. But that identity in one of them or each one of them started creating division in that church. So Paul writes to them, 1 Corinthians 1, I'll just reference one verse there. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. And he says, you know, I plead with you brethren. Wow, can you imagine the apostle Paul writing like this? He says, I'm making a humble request. I plead with you brethren. You can see his heart there. He says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that means I am doing it in his name. I'm doing it on his behalf. This is what Jesus would do if he were to come to the church in Corinth. Are you listening? I plead with you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What? That you all speak the same thing. Pastor, that's impossible. Hey, but he's making that request and it's coming from Jesus. 
That you all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you. That you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So he's pleading, I want you to be like this. Forget about Paul. Forget about Apollos. Forget about Peter. He even goes on to ask them, Did, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Were you baptized in the name of Peter? I mean, look, these are just men through whom God worked. But our identity is always in Jesus. And we got to protect the unity. That being of one accord, that being of one mind, that Jesus Christ wants among his people. Amen? So this is so important for us to say, yes, unity must describe, must be a very important descriptor of us as a community. And we must work towards it. It doesn't happen automatically. Paul writes in Ephesians 4 verses 1, 2, and 3, he says, I, I a prisoner of the Lord, uh, I, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with lowliness and gentleness, with the long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That means there are things that I must do. Verse 2 talks about it. He says, you know, you walk with lowliness. That means you humble yourself. It's not about who gets importance. It's not who gets recognized. Walk with lowliness. Walk with gentleness. Walk with long-suffering, meaning patience. Um, bearing with one another in love. Why? So that we endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in peace. So that's, that's something we must all work towards as a community. Unity is important. And uh, we read this last Sunday in Romans 16, 17 and 18. Where Paul says, brethren, note those who cause divisions among divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. That means if people are trying to cause divisions and offense... Be alert. Avoid that. Now how do they do it? Nobody's going to come and say, look, I'm coming here to disturb the peace here. No. It comes there in verse 17, Paul says. It comes through uh, their own selfish interest. They are trying to, uh, they're, they're there to satisfy their own belly. Now that's an old term just to say. They're, they're pursuing their own self-interest. So the things that they are saying is motivated out of a selfish interest. And they come with flattering words, smooth words and flattering speech. So be careful, he says. Don't let divisions and offenses be stirred up amongst us. So, you know, we can identify things that disturb unity. Things like gossip, slander, evil speaking. The moment you hear somebody begin to slander somebody else... You make a choice. I will not be a part of this conversation. I am not. Why? This is my family. This is my family. I must protect the unity of this house. I will not participate in that. If you've got a problem with that person, go speak to that person in front of that person. That's the way to solve it. Amen? Amen? Not going around telling 10 other people how bad that person is. Hey, you got a problem with that person? Go talk to that person. Sort it out. That's how you deal with it. But if I don't want to sort it out with that person, but I want to tell 10 other people, I am slandering. I am gossiping. I am speaking evil. And God calls it an abomination. God doesn't like it. Are you listening? Yes. So let's say this again. This is my family. I will protect the unity of my family. So no, don't, I'll, don't even permit it. Somebody's coming in, you know, with flattering words and smooth words. They're saying, ah, do you know about Pastor Astros? Ten years ago, he was so different. But I like that old pastor. I mean, the pastor of the old days. <laughs> He said, look, if you've got a problem with pastor, go talk to him. Don't talk to me. I don't want to be a part of this. Yeah. I mean, people can take offense to all kinds of things. Just this past week, when pastor came, he said, pastor, I watch your TV program every Sunday, uh, uh, every Monday, but I have only one issue with you. You only wear blue. You need to wear white. I mean, this is an elderly pastor telling me. Now, what do I do? 
I just smile and keep going. I mean, he gets offended because I wear blue. <laughs> hey, people can get offended for all kinds of things. But the nice thing is he came and told me in my face. Right? He told me. He doesn't like that. Okay, fine. Smile and go. Smile and wave, boys. <laughs> you know, just let it go. You know? don't, <laughs> don't let it affect you. Right? But this was a very petty thing. You know, once we actually, there was a time when I used to wear those Hawaiian shirts, you know. We got a call, phone call from some pastor in some other part of the country complaining about my shirt. <laughs> I mean, that's how serious they thought it was, you know. I, I feel, you know, just wearing it. But anyway, these are silly matters, right. But I'm telling about, you know, when people start slandering and speaking things about other people in church. You know, say, hey, sorry. This is my family. If you have a problem, go talk to that person. Sit down and sort it out there directly. If you're not willing to sort it out, don't talk about it to other people. It doesn't help. Right? Or things like rebellion and dishonor. You see, the greatest, one of the greatest laws in, in the Bible is the law of honor. You find it everywhere. Parents or children honor your parents. Wives, honor your husbands. Employees, honor your bosses. It's in the Bible. Spiritually, honor those who are over you. And it is the first commandment that brings a promise. What is the promise? That it may go well with you. So the blessing of honor is, it will go well. So when you honor, children honor your parents, it'll go well with you. Employees honor your bosses, it'll go well with you. It's the law in the word of God. Honor. Honor is giving respect. Amen? And when you disrespect somebody who's been placed over your life, your parents, your boss, your husband, your spiritual leader, your, are, you are for feeding that blessing that it may go well with you. Amen? Now, some child may say, but I don't agree with my parents. You know, we have that. Children say, I don't agree with my mom or dad. That's okay. You still honor. You still honor. Because they are your In the workplace, I don't agree with my boss. It's okay. Still honor, he's your boss. You still honor him. He is your. If you don't want, then find a job somewhere else. <laughs> but you can't do that with family. You can't go find other parents. <laughs> In family, your parents are your parents. Children honor your. You may not always agree with the decision, but you still honor. What happens? It goes well with you. Amen? So that's how we have to be in the house of God. You honor those who are being placed over. You honor them and it goes well with us. It's a law in the word of God. But the moment I start speaking against those set over me, it's dishonoring. Start speaking against parents, bosses, uh, uh, in the house of God or your spiritual leaders, you are dishonoring. You're fulfilling the blessing. So if the moment somebody starts speaking like that, say, hey, if you got an issue, go sit down and sort it out with that person. But I will not dishonor that person. Right? And self-seeking. So these are just things that disturb our unity. Let's move to the next point. The second descriptor of our church community is that we want to be a people where there is fellowship. The, this is an important word in the New Testament, the Greek word koinonia. Many, many of you know that word. It simply means to share, to have things in common, uh, to do things together. That's fellowship. It means sharing. 
doing things together, having things in common, uh, partnering with one another in, in doing things together. And again, you find this throughout um, the New Testament. If you look at the church in Jerusalem, you find that when these believers, when these people came to know, know the Lord, what did they engage in? They engaged in fellowship. So just read uh, one or two passages there, Acts 2, 42 to 47. They, these are the new believers, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship koinonia they were sharing with one another in the breaking of bread and in prayers and then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done to the apostles now all who believed it together had all things in common they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need so continually daily continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let me read Acts 4.32 as well. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So there was a sharing. Now, of course, this has to be understood in the context of what was happening. On the day of Pentecost, the Jews, like we mentioned, they had left their homes across that region. They had all come to Jerusalem. And... Uh, now Pentecost happened. They experienced the work of the Holy Spirit. They decided to stay on in Jerusalem. So obviously uh, they didn't have their possessions. Maybe they you know, brought clothes for 10 days or two weeks, uh, brought along some provisions for that time. But now they are staying, an extended stay, indefinitely extended. So what happens? They need to be helped. And so the, the believers from Jerusalem were uh, sharing with others and they're doing what they can to sustain that community so that's the context but the important point is they did that they shared and that is koinonia so in our in our context also we share we engage with one another in doing things together and uh, some of the ways that we uh, we do this and i'll just mention these three is one is in life groups which means that in small settings, you get together and uh, uh, you talk about the word. This fellowship is spiritual. It's primarily spiritual in nature. Meaning you're talking about word. You're praying. You're worshiping together. And of course, you share in food and so on and, 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 and those other things. So uh, there is that sense of doing life together, of being together, of journeying together. So life groups is a very important thing. Now, you know, some people say, no, I, I, you know, there is no fellowship happening at APC. My next question is, do you go to a life group? No, I don't. I'm too busy. Then how will you have fellowship? Right? Because that life group is designed for fellows. For you to get to know people. Right? So before we complain, let's do what has been provided for us. By the church. The small groups are an important part. Another very important part is to serve in church. It is to be a part of the volunteer teams. We have over, like I mentioned last Sunday, we have over 300 volunteers serving across our locations. And now these are formed into teams, volunteer teams. And those teams are a great place to have fellowship. Because you're doing something together. But at the same time, you're interacting, you are uh, rubbing shoulders, you are uh, you're, you're praying together, you're doing things together in those teams. You're, you're building relationships. So that's why we encourage you to get involved and volunteer in any team. It may be an ushering team, maybe a setup team, that's hard work. So choose something like, like a greeters, you know, <laughs> just, or connect or whatever. Be a part of a team where things are happening. You're working together with other people. What will happen? You're going to build friendships. You're going to build relationships. You're going to interact. And fellowship will happen through that. Right? So we encourage people. Be a part of those volunteer teams. And then care for one another. When you know people are in need of help, do something to share. So that's fellowship. Us actually being a people who share things together by doing things together. And... Uh, I'll just skip the next verse and let's go to the last one, the, the point of power. Power should be an in, important descriptor of us as a church family. Otherwise, all we become is another social club. There are many good communities around Bangalore City. So what's the difference between them and us? This is it. God at 
work amongst us. The power of God must be so evident amongst us. In, in our homes, and when we come together in worship, when we go out as a people to minister, the power of God, that's what differentiate, differentiates us from the rest, other communities that, that meet all over our city or, or, or in other places. And I'll just reference two, verses, two passages, and I'll close here. Acts 4, 32 to 33, look at the early church. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, that's being of one accord, Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. That's fellowship. And what do we see next? Verse 33. And with great power. So that's the third thing. The third descriptor of this early church community. So there is one accord. There is fellowship. And there is also power. And with great power. The apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was on them. So we want to be a community of power. We want to be a pe people among whom God's power will be manifested and displayed. And so we press into it. We journey into it as a people. And I'll just read Acts 5, 12 through 16. This is what will happen when the, when the power of God is being displayed. And this is what we are continuously praying for. Uh, it says here in verse 12, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly. And believers were added to the Lord, multitude of both men and women. The church grows. Believers are added to the Lord. You invite your friends to church. Come to church on Sunday. Come with me. Why? Because there is unity, there is fellowship, but there's also the power of God. God may touch your life. God may heal your sickness. God may deliver you from your problems. So come with me to church on Sunday. And you invite them. Believers are added to the house of God. You will be encouraged to invite people to come in as the power of God is displayed in this place. And it says in verse 15, they brought the sick into the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. And a multitude gathered from surrounding cities. So people started coming from other cities. They started coming to Jerusalem, bringing sick people. And those were tormented by unclean spirits. And they were all healed. So that's the kind of community we want to be. So you say, now pastor, why do you pray for the sick on Sundays? Why do you do that? Well, that's the early church. That's our DNA. That's who we are supposed to be. In fact, if we are not that, then we are not being the church of the Bible. Amen? So, but pastor, my, I come from a theological tradition that doesn't allow that. Well, just let's read the Bible. Let's agree on the Bible. Do we see it in the Bible? Yes, we see it in the Bible. So let's go for it. Amen? And that's the key with which people were reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When they saw the power of God. And so we are going to make that journey. We're continuing to press and say, God, we want that to happen whenever we gather together. So three things and I'll close here. Three descriptors of us as a community. Number one. All right, those are awake. <laughs> Number one. Number two. And third, so may this, these three things describe us as a church community, right? May these three things stand out. And people talk about APC, they should say, wow, it's amazing how they're all walking in one accord. They're people from different backgrounds, but they're going together. Amen? And then when they talk about us, they should say, wow, there is genuine fellowship. People are caring. People are sharing. People are doing things together. They should say that. And when they talk about us, they should say, that's a community where the power of God is very evident. Go there. God will meet you. Amen? Let's close. Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to be part of a church family. Uh, we thank you for all that's been shared. We pray that you'll stir our hearts to commit, to be a part, to participate, and to make this journey together. And Father, I pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. 
we would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.